like, oh. and it was Mine's a, a bit like that too. I'm pretty sure I just heard Colts online dinging on the doorbell, but I'm like, somebody else can sort that out. Oh, no, how are you? Good, thank you. How are you? How are you coping with uh, the new life? It's the change to schooling at home has been a bit epic. Oh, yeah. It, it's like thrown, like I knew, but I kind of imagined I would be able to set them to a task and do something. Yeah. And that, but no. And it's all one-on-one, like, time with my youngest. She's yes. seven. And yes. so we're dividing that up now. And my husband's a much better teacher than me, and he's been a teacher for a very long time. And even though I trained in her grade and he didn't, he, and also he's got the dad power of, he comes in and says, hey, do this thing. And she goes, okay. And I'm like, I've tried for two hours to get her <laughs> to do that. So there's a little bit of angst. And I'm not going to vent it all out. More than I already have. Yeah, look, we are still on school holidays in New South Wales and I wasn't sure how the school holidays were going to pan out because I'm still um, working a lot of days. I took a day off today because I was like, oh, I just need I need a bit of chill time. But, um, yeah, I wasn't sure how that was going to pan out. But actually the kids have been okay. I thought they'd be climbing the walls, but the weather's been okay. They've been able to get into the backyard. And weirdly they get along way better in lockdown than they ever did before lockdown, which has been really nice. That's great. And did that start from word go? Because we had a, about yeah. two or three days of that, like a honeymoon. But now we've descended into like straight into 10 years of marriage <laughs> sort of feeling with them. But so we all no, straight look, I into think it. I think they went into it pretty quickly, you know, once they realised that they didn't have any other playmates. <laughs> they, you know, they kind of yeah. figured out that they were going to have to play with one another and you know, those were their only options. It's funny how you settle into a new routine and a new normal, you know, like normally if we were this many days at home, we'd be like, can we go out? Can we do something? But they just know that the answer's no. (laughs) And they know why and all of that. So they just, you know, that in the end, they're quite happy. And it's been nice because I always complain that they don't use our yard enough and I have to like, you know, take care of it and whatever. And I'm like, we really just could be in a unit or something. But now they are taking advantage of having a backyard, which is nice. Yeah, Yeah, I'm really glad I have outdoor space because I think right now I just, and we need a lot of spaces with five of us. So we don't, we need lots of different places to be in. So even my teenager, who's normally always in her bedroom, but she's also at school and doing other things. And so because she doesn't have that, we put the tent up in the backyard so she goes out into the tent and it's awesome. like her other space that she can yep. go to with no one else because she doesn't want to be with us because yeah, we're, just, we're annoying. But yeah. So what are you going to do? So for this weekend being Anzac weekend, that's big for you because you have which yeah. publication are we talking about? Do you have them both to hold up? I'm still with Grandpa in my head, but I know you're probably beyond <laughs> Grandpa in terms yeah. of your- Yes, I brought um, Anzac Girl to hold up and show everybody. So this is my new um, picture book, probably for older kind of, in a picture book scale, older readers. So I think the publisher's sort of saying six to ten, although I actually think that kids even older than that can get a lot out of it. Um, So, yeah, it is uh, a big weekend coming up for us. It's nice to be able to take a moment and just you know, acknowledge the people in our family because it wasn't just my great-grandmother who I wrote this beautiful book about, um, but we've had other family members who served over the years. So, yeah, we'll certainly be taking a moment over the weekend. And I think my youngest is six now, so I think that's a really nice time to start having kind of more detailed conversations and to delve into that a little bit more. I have more questions too. So even though you may, we may have answered them, over the last few years, you go through waves where they just kind of forget everything that they may have been told and they need another answer and it, they build yeah. in how complex they are. Yeah, yeah because, there's, I mean, there's a lot to unpack there, right? You know, it's a difficult thing to kind of bring to the table for young kids and, you know, even I have complex feelings about it and I'm sure a lot of other people do. Um, Alice, my great-grandmother, certainly through her time in the war, she had really complex feelings about it. You know, she started off with these really straightforward, you know, sense of duty and um, really not asking any questions. But, of course, as the war went on and all the things that she experienced and saw and whatever, that all of those kind of questions start to come out. And I think a lot of us still, you know, 
have that sort of complexity in our experience of Anzac Day even now. Yeah. What did she do uh, in, what was her role? Did she have a role, like a job? Yeah, so she was, um, she was a nurse through um, World War I. So she started out, uh, and World War II, actually. So in World War II, okay. she um, rose to the rank of major and was the assistant controller for Victoria in the Army Medical Service. Um, so she became quite senior uh, later on. But this book covers her time in World War I, which is when she wrote quite extensive diaries, which I used um, both in the research and directly in the book. Uh, so she served to start off with in Cairo. Um, she was there, I think, she must have been there for about a year in Cairo. So she saw the um, soldiers from Gallipoli come in. Um, obviously, they had been um, treated to a degree before they arrived all the way back at Cairo because there was a bit of a, um, I think there were a couple of days for them to actually get back, but they still sort of came in um, quite badly wounded and a lot of them coming in all at once. So that was quite confronting for her. Mm-hmm. Um, and then in 1916, through to the end of the war, she went and served in France in sort of a couple of places in France. So initially she was in Rouen, which wasn't so close to the battlefront. It was sort of, you know, the, the hospital that you were taken to after you would had that initial first aid type stuff done. Uh, and then for some time she served right at the front line in what's called a casualty clearing station, which is the first place that they bring them from the front line. Um, And that was very um, difficult times. It was confronting and yeah, just, I think there was a lot of work on. So you're busy and physically sort of exhausted, but also just emotionally, I think she was quite, she ended up actually, I think with, a bit of PTSD from that, at least in the short term. I'm, I'm not sure how long that lasted. It's not quite clear, but she describes herself as having had a bit of shell shock um, because not only are you seeing the worst of the injuries and things like that coming in directly off the battlefield, um, but they were quite close to the front lines. So they had gas come through um, where, like the, through the hospital. There was a, a bombardment one night um, which, you know, you're not supposed to shell the hospitals. Um, so there was quite a bit of angst in the camp about that. They, they were talking about, well, was it an accident? Did they do it on purpose? Um, but, of course, then the soldiers were returning fire, which meant that in addition to the bombs, there was artillery shells. And it, w- it was quite a dangerous place to be. She had several, there were several times described in her diary when really she could have been killed, you know, where she was sort of standing by a bed and, um, yeah, a bit of a, a bit of shell or, or a shell casing or whatever would just fall through sort of right next to you. Um, another time she was in the shower and she um, she describes how vulnerable that felt because you're naked, you know, like... Yeah, there's another and, level there, yeah. Yeah, that's right. You know, already in a vulnerable situation and then, you know, to have this um, sort of life-threatening situation happen at that same time. So, yeah, she was a pretty amazing woman and she went through really a lot in those four years. Wow. Wow. Did you... I don't know if you saw Downton Abbey, but that's probably my only... And my... I've had um, family members who are nurses in the two wars as well, but yeah. bizarrely Downton Abbey was the first time I'd seen anything in terms of the, you know, a kind of a way of where, how that may have felt yeah. at home and then the way that people were actually interacting. Cause I don't watch a lot of movies like that cause I am very easily upset. So I have very, very mm. emotional reactions to things. So movies I find difficult cause they're so realistic and Downton Abbey was kind of a little bit more sterile in that way probably. But did you find anything? Did you think that was? Did you did you see that? I was going to say, did you think that? I didn't. Matched? I didn't see that series of Downton Abbey. I used to. I watched a couple of the early series, but I feel seasons. But I feel like that must have been a little bit later. Yeah, it's probably um, like the most irrelevant thing I could have thought of. To say. No, not at all. Because <laughs> actually, you know, it's weird because I grew up with this story of my great grandmother was a war hero and she'd been in this hospital while it was bombed and she won one of the most um, prestigious medals. I think the most. Um, important medal that a non um someone who's not a soldier is able to receive um so i grew up with that that idea that the military medal ah okay so i grew up 
with that as a concept, but I guess a lot like what you're saying, I didn't really realise what that meant until I saw the ABC mini series Anzac Girl, um, which, so Peter Reese wrote a book called The Other Anzacs um, in the early 2000s, I think, and it was, and my mum had given me the book, but it was one of those things that was sitting on my TBR pile and I'd never quite made it to. And then they turned it into a mini series. So I'm one of those terrible people who watched the mini series before they read the book. Um, But it was very much that when you came to that scene with the shelling and, and even, even not just the shelling, but the fact that, you know, I'd always imagined a hospital was in like a building um, rather than being just a bunch of tents and mud and just like wooden boards laid out, you know, in between the tents to join them together. So there was so much of it that, you know, and as a kid, I think it makes sense to have those concepts, but you know, it's one of those things where you, you have an idea in your head when you're a kid and you don't challenge it as you get older. And then suddenly something causes you to challenge it and you're like, Oh gosh, that was such a childish sort of concept that I'd had in my mind that I just held on to, you know, and I hadn't thought about, um, oh, actually, (laughs) you know, they probably didn't have these nice lino floors and, you know, beeping machines and all of the things that I would normally associate with a hospital. You had her diaries to go by? Yeah, so my mum... My mum had a transcript of her diaries, which is actually missing a bunch of pages. But at some point, the original diaries had been typed out, transcribed by, I think, one of my aunts. Um, And it appears to me that each copy that was given out to a member of the family was typed up separately because, you know, this was well before computers. I don't think they're photocopies, you know. So somebody had, had spent all this time, which is beautiful, typing out the diaries. Um... The original diaries are at the Australian War Memorial and they have one copy of the transcript as well. And they've scanned all of those pages and they're available for anyone to look at and read on the Australian War Memorial website, which is pretty amazing. Um, But I'm so glad there's a transcription because the, you know, for me, that real old style cursive, you know, it's, I just, I just can't, you know, (laughs) like I'm staring at, what, what was that? So it's nice to have the transcription as well. Um, So, yeah, I used a combination of the copy that mum had and the one online because it actually had all the pages. I'm not sure what happened to some of the pages of mum's. But, yeah, it's a pretty amazing thing to be able to really go back and have that first-hand account. Mm. And how did you work with the illustrations that are there? Did you choose, have a lot of say in what happened with how it was put together? Um, I had the opportunity to comment, um, but I didn't probably, like there were a few places where I sort of said, no, I think this needs to look like this or like that. Um, But Jess is amazing. Jess Ratcliffe is the illustrator. Um, And from the moment she sent through the samples, it was just, you know, you could tell how beautiful it was going to be. So she kind of came to me and asked me where she could find you know, what sort of source materials that I had used and and the research that I'd done. And so I pointed her in that direction so that she could not only find, because she's used a combination, um, I might just show the the end papers because they're a beautiful example. I don't know if you can see that. Ah, wow. So she's used this beautiful combination of um, her own, um, you know, original artwork combined with photos so some period photos and some things that she's taken um let's see if I can find another page like for example on this page here um you can see she's taken some photos of some flowers so there's a lot of that sort of stuff um that mixed media I'm probably using all the wrong terms I'm not artistic at all they all sound this. great <laughs> to me yeah I um, can't wait for our copy to come I was hoping I'd have it ready but <laughs> Our mail service. <laughs> oh, I know. We're yeah. all the same waiting for, I'm waiting for packages every day. I'm like, oh, what's going to be? What's gonna be? <laughs> but I, I love the one. collage style. Yeah, go on. sorry. Yeah. So she, yes, the collage style is amazing. So she's done a beautiful job. So I kind of pointed her in the direction of some things, but then she went off and did her own research. So I know she um, used the State Library of Victoria and um, also the Australian War Memorials website. But um, one of the things I love about it is she also um, used at least one image from her family history. So she had, I think it might have been a 
I don't know, perhaps it was a great grandfather or a great uncle or something who was in the war. And so she's used one of his photos in there. And I really love that we both have that family kind of history entwined in the story. So mm -hmm. yeah, she's just done a beautiful job. And there was, as I say, I'm, I, I'm not that artistic. So, you know, the publisher will send me these spreads and be like, hi, Kate, you know, have you got anything to say about this? And I just feel so out of my depth. It's like, I don't know. So, you know, in most of the, I've got three published picture books now. And I think in all the cases, there's only been a handful of things that I've pulled out where I really think, oh, that wasn't what I was trying to say at all there. Um, and I, and, and I don't, you know, like I'm open to the idea of an illustrator bringing in new things and new yeah. ideas, but there are times when it really does completely say something different to what the intent yeah. was or whatever. So it's more those times where I might be like, oh, actually. And, and there was one I felt really, really bad. With, they were practically finished, the illustrations. And I had commented on one particular page. I was like, oh, I just don't think that's that reflects what was happening there. And the publisher did go back to Jess and say, oh, I know we've already done this one, but would you mind? And she was amazing. She did it again. I don't know if she was swearing quietly to herself in the background but it just looks some you know like it's just so lovely now yeah. you know you otherwise I would have had that niggle in my mind of like oh that wasn't what I was trying to say there so you know yeah. I hope she's happy with it I'm certainly just the work that she's done just visually it's amazing and the publisher as well put a lot of effort into it in the sense that like the paper quality is great the cover is sort of embossed and you know so those little details I think make a big yeah. difference they do, they do. My kids love those where it's, you can just feel that um, quality is a horrible word, isn't it? It's kind of loaded, <laughs> it's a bit loaded. Yeah. But they yeah, do. Yeah, but, you, but can. you can. And, you know, like it's it's different strokes for different folks, right? It depends on the book and whatever, but I think this book and the market that it's yeah. aimed at and whatever, it's just nice to feel the texture and, and all of that. Yeah, yeah. So... You also have a podcast that you do called One More Page. Yep. And how long has that been going for now? Um, so this is our third year. We started at the start of 2018. So we're up to... Oh. So, when did I meet you? Did I meet you in... Tw no, 2019. I think we met last year at the CYA yeah. conference in the middle of last year. Yeah, so yeah. We, were, we were up there doing some Because I was there the first year, but I don't think I... I didn't go... Nat yeah, was I, I the remember podcast were there thing, in 2018 though. doing some podcasting from CYA. Um, but yeah, we met last year at last year's CYA. Yeah, no, it was just it was lovely to see a familiar, friendly face, yeah. you know, like from Twitter, but whatever. It felt <laughs> yeah. like oh, we, we totally know each other. I know. It was like, <laughs> so that's Twitter's lovely. real life, right? It's my real life, anyway. <laughs> yeah. Too. so yeah and is the um have you changed how you record or do you, you normally you're not normally in the same space when you record anyway are you so we would normally nat liz and i would normally record our bits together um but we've always recorded the interviews um remotely yeah. and usually the kids capers section which nat does most of the time is remote as well so we already kind of had the setup to do that and we have in the past recorded one or two episodes where we just for whatever reason couldn't get all of us in the same room at the same time um we have recorded them remotely before so it is a different experience and i think particularly because there are three of us uh it's more difficult than a two-way conversation because you're always trying to jump in over at the top of each other and we record on an audio only platform so you don't even have the visual cues to kind of go off so we have to be a bit more scripted so we always we do script our podcasts but when we're together, we're a bit fast and loose with the script. It's it's just a few points about what we want to talk about and it's not, um, it doesn't go into any detail. But, yeah, if if we're remote, we have to kind of flesh it out a little bit more because otherwise we just end up talking over the top of each other. It's really hard. I find he, like on this that there's often, it's really hard to pick up when... Yeah, when you're going to all of a sudden be... Talk and then I have to edit out the, the bit where you can't hear... Yeah, because you're talking over the top. <laughs> and then sometimes there's a bit of a lag or a delay. There was one interview, I can't remember when, uh, who it was now, but there was just a, it must have been half a second or something delay. And so we would just constantly both speak at the same time. Yeah, I don't, yeah, I've had that too I with mean, the platform we use. It seems to be, I don't know if the platform's improved or I've got 
NBN now, if that makes a difference. But yeah, it's happening less and less. But I, I've done interviews. And the great thing, we use a platform called Zencaster, which is really good because it records each person at their own end, which means that if the internet breaks up or whatever, the sound, like when I'm listening, when I'm recording and speaking to them, it does break up in my ear. But then when we play it back, everything's crystal clear because it's recorded at their end and then transferred the sound across the internet. So that's great. But it has sometimes meant in the past that I am there in this interview, like, and they're crackling and they're breaking up and, and I'm trying to figure out like when they're finished because I've got my pre, you know, my questions that I want to ask them. And it can be really tricky because then you can't make any kind of intelligent remark. Um, and it, even if I've heard what they're saying, I'm just so focused on, listening for the end of that sentence and being ready that that I just can't also kind of fabricate something intelligent to say. And respond, yeah, which, yeah, and I'm terrible at that anyway and I don't do any uh, questions and lists because I will then want to get them out really quickly. I know myself well enough. I can't wait. And so I will just be thinking, come on, because I've got to say the next thing. I'm not listening at all. Yeah. And all I have to do is run through these and then I'll be kind of stuck. So I'm always, yeah. I'm actually better if I don't prepare a lot, although it does go a little bit wobbly sometimes. Yeah, I but. can see the advantage of that actually because it is tricky. And often like the person that you're speaking to um, will actually have answered some of your questions as well. And then you're there with a list and you're like, oh, now I don't know where I was at because I'm pretty sure they answered that one. I can't remember. Did they, you know, like, so, you know, I, I, I do say to people, you know, here are some of the questions. This is a guide. We may go off track and I might end up asking you a whole bunch of different things or I might skip some if we're running out of time or whatever. But some people prefer, you know, the confidence that comes with knowing what you're going to be asked, you know, especially if they haven't done many interviews. Yes, I have had uh, a couple of people say, oh, what will we talk about? And there was a moment where I was like, I don't know. <laughs> I haven't really figured that out yet. But just trying to, and that's why every every single thing is different in what I'm doing. And some people have a book that they need to um, talk about because it's new and they're explaining what's going on in the book. And that's always easier because then they know what they kind of, everyone, I've figured out authors, other authors, I'm still learning. They kind of know the bit that they're going to say. And then it's so, that's so easy to edit as well because it's like they know what they're doing. And I can just sit back and go, yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So that's much easier. Do you have if have a lot of new podcasts started up? We're probably way over time. I haven't set my new Zoom on this computer to tell me how long we've been. So I'll just guess that we are because I always am over time. But that's okay. okay. Do you if have a lot of people started up podcasts since this started? Should I be asking you to give them advice on how to do uh, them? I don't know, to be perfectly honest. I assume give it's becoming anyway. more popular. Give advice. Okay, so top tips for a podcast. Always expect okay. it's going to take way more time than um, you ever think it's going to. <laughs> That's definitely the number one. Um, don't think you can just, like, whip it together in about 10 minutes. I think Zencaster, the platform I just talked about, is probably number two. It is really um, quite... Um, quite a good platform we've been really happy with it and at the moment so normally the free option um, has certain limits around time and how many guests you can have or whatever but uh, with the coronavirus they've removed all of those so you basically get everything for free uh, except for that they do offer like an editing kind of option uh, which is not free uh, so that would be my second tip and I think thirdly uh, would be just enjoy it you know, um, I think don't go into it for the wrong reasons. Don't do it because you're thinking, oh, I need to publicise my book and normally I would, you know, go out to schools or whatever. I mean, look, to be perfectly honest, that's part of the reason I started it, <laughs> but I wouldn't be still doing it if I didn't love it as well. So, yeah, I guess you can have two reasons. But, um, yeah, it's it's great because as you've probably realised from what you're doing, it's such a great opportunity to just tap on people's shoulders and I get to speak to so many amazing and interesting people. Um, and we've had very, you know, occasionally we have someone say, Oh, look, I'm sorry. I just don't have time. But most of the time people are happy to speak to you. Um, and I just love it. And I'm always going over time. Um, and we end up having to cut stuff out, <laughs> but I just can't stop talking to these people because they're always got so much cool stuff to say. Yeah. Yes. And look, you already had three tips ready to go. You're so prepared. I'm, Look at me. Oh, that's amazing. Um, I'm learning so much 
through this process from about what people do and I know I don't get to practice my own because of the way things have changed but instead I've got this other opportunity to learn from people in a really direct way because when I edit I hear it all it's very technical sorry we're getting very but I hear it all again and again yeah and then because I'm a slow processor so you know in a day I will realize that that was a joke or that wow, that was actually such good advice. I wish I'd asked this further question, but at least I heard that one properly. But I get that time to process a little bit yeah. later, which is really helpful for me. And I went into this completely not knowing what on earth I was doing. I didn't know I'd get to speak to so many amazing people. I didn't know I'd still be going. But now I'm thinking things like I might have to learn how to ask the questions properly you know, I, don't, I, don't, to... I like the spontaneity of it though you know I think that's quite nice it just feels honest and you know people Everyone's want to relate forgiving. to you I think well I think the biggest thing for, to me for, for a podcast certainly and I think it's the same in this video type of a format is the sense that you know people that that's what I've always loved because I was a podcast listener for a long time before we made our own podcast and that's what I loved about it kind of tuning in with the same people every week and you know, like, and, and then sometimes it was a little weird when you met them in real life because you felt like you knew them and they actually didn't know you for a yep. bar of soap. And you'd but be like, now, Hi. I know. And then now, but now people must do that to you. Yeah, 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 for sure. Although, yes, I mean, it's funny, isn't it? Like when you're on the opposite side of it, you're like, oh God, they must think I'm a total weirdo. Whereas when we get that, I'm always just like, God, I can't believe anybody actually listens to what we make. I mean, you see the stats oh. and you know that people listen, but to have someone come up and be like, oh, I heard your show the other day. It's like, oh, God, really? Sometimes you forget that when you... It's a bit like with the books that you write. It's actually much easier to do if you can forget that someone's going to read it one day, right? Because yeah. otherwise you get all kind of caught oh, up yeah. in your head or whatever. Yeah. I don't really think about that ever, to be honest, because that would be too hard. I don't know who that would be. And so then it's not specific and then I would get confused. <laughs> yeah, for sure, for sure. Yep. So, yeah, sometimes I just forget that other people are listening. So it's always fun to meet people, you know, in real life who yeah. have been listening. Sometimes people are really like, oh, I'm sorry, I'm not up to date. And it's like, do you, do you, you know, like there's no obligation on people to actually listen to what we make. Oh, oh well, we love your podcast. But I oh, love, thank you. But it's, I also love that I can tell who's speaking. Like I actually understand, because I find it hard with some podcasts with multiple voices that who is who. If mm. one has a terrible microphone, you'll always know it's them. So I, that's easy. But if everyone has the same sort of way of speaking and this, they're on the same system, I actually spend a lot of time not really knowing who's who. But yeah. after a year, I may still not know which person has which life. Yes, uh, yes. For so, sure. yeah. Whereas I always feel like we all really know who's who. Um, oh, that's good. I'm glad you feel that way because Nat, um, Nat's boyfriend is French. So I think perhaps that's sort of part of it. He doesn't have quite the same ear as a native English speaker, but he always gets confused between me and that. He'll be like, oh, you said this oh. thing. And that'll be like, no, no, that wasn't me. <laughs> that was Kate. <laughs> oh, no, I'd say, yeah, you have a very distinctive voice, which sounds like a very writerly thing to say. There we go. <laughs> <laughs> it does. Just, yeah. Yeah, we certainly have distinctive writing voices. You wouldn't get as confused on the page. No, <laughs> no, no, not at all. Thank you so much for coming on. And I hope you have a good and maybe peaceful weekend thank you you too um, <laughs> um yeah look it's it's a strange kind of a, a day you know it's it's not a celebration particularly for those of us who are not in the services i think for the people who are in the services it's, it's a different sort of a day um but yeah i'm, look, I'm looking forward to sharing some stories with my kids and yeah just reflecting a little bit all right thanks very much for having me on see you later bye